I've been a horror movie fan for many of my formative years, from drive-in movies to double feature chiller. And though many think most horror fans are white adolescent males, I was a fan too, a black girl. And in 80s horror, the heroes were girls, white girls. Film theorists called them final girls. These women fought and survived to the end of the movie and outsmarted the killer. This was awesome, but I'd been so programmed I hadn't noticed what was missing, the black girl. So I set out to find them and figure out, were there black women in horror? This is my final girl. This is KLM Brooklyn, and you're watching My Final Girl, the show that honors all the info and history on black women in American horror cinema. So uh, first things first, I want to do a shout out to Simrit C, a great gal from the UK that visited a few weeks back. Uh, she went to check out the horror scene in New York, and a friend referred her to me. We hung out. We had a great chat. I think she might be writing a blog or a tidbit about her time here, possibly including me. Uh, she also had got a chance, had got, she also had a chance to visit Lloyd Kaufman's studio and actually meet Lloyd Kaufman himself uh, during her stay. So, wow, on that, she's a lucky gal. And yeah, she's a reviewer at horrortalks.com. And if you want to hit her up on w Instagram, I think her handle is at wickergirl666. So, yeah, um, let's see here. Uh, this is our first show. So to that, I think it's, it's uh, fitting that I give you a little background on me and a little bit about what this is about. It kind of seems obvious, but maybe it isn't. So me, Christina, is my official name, but uh, for all intents and purposes, and for my Twitter, ha Twitter handle, which is KLM Brooklyn, I'm just going to roll with that. KLM Brooklyn, I've been a horror fan, buff enthusiast, and now scholar in training. Since I was about five or six, I've loved horror. My mom knew I loved horror when I was a kid. I would watch do a double feature thriller uh, on Channel 20 in Detroit. Uh, or Channel 50, Channel 50 or Channel 20 in Detroit. And, uh, yeah, I just grew up loving it. My first official in-the-theater spooky movie uh, was An American Werewolf in London. And uh, needless to say, I had, like, the eye-covering moments where I did the peek through the eyes. And my mom, I remember her saying, if you keep doing that, um, we're going to leave right now. So I didn't, and I, my eyes were really wide, really wide. And then, you know, at certain points where I couldn't take any more, I said, can I go to the bathroom? And literally, the theater had these holes where you can kind of peek through the door, the captain's door. So I would peek through that or the crack just to keep watching it, but, you know, kind of hide my face or shield myself, whatever that's all about. But I think something about that in general, I never stopped loving horror. And now I'm doing it, uh, yeah, scholar in training. I am doing my second master's degree, again, 
uh, on horror, my first master's degree, my MA at Long Island University, Brooklyn, uh, was on the women of French horror, and my thesis was called Objectification Repackaged, the Women of 21st Century French Horror, Horror, and uh, my second master's, or my master's of fine arts, which I'm completing, knock on wood, uh, at the end of this year, um, I, be, I decided to bring it home, uh, make it a little bit more personal. And um, at first, at first go around, I was thinking to do J or K horror, uh, some form of Asian horror. And then I was thinking, well, maybe I'll look into Italian horror. And I was more looking at the continent or, you know, where can I find women in horror? Or even like broaden the Euro European sp uh, spectrum of what I was doing before. But I, you know, I was reading um, a review of a French director that had commented on how John Carpenter really spoke to him, and I thought about it. I was like, yeah, I should maybe do this, bring it back home. And when I was looking at American horror, I was like, and yeah, maybe I want to figure out where the black women are in horror. Are there black women, black people? What's what's going on there? And I, then I, it can, became like a personal mission to debunk the black people always die in horror idea. So I start looking at black women in horror and come to find out there are more than one or two or three or four or five or six. There are quite a few. So this show, each uh, episode, I'm going to look at a different woman of black horror and an aspect uh, of American horror cinema and, and, the, um, and the racial aspect of that. So yeah, a few things. Maybe let's just define, uh, let's see here. What is My Final Girl? Wh what is the show? What is the thesis you're doing, KLM? And I will say My Final Girl is um, kind of a black female take or a black take uh, or even a minority take on the final girl theory, which was penned by Carol Clover in her book, Men, Women, and Chainsaws. And the final girl was uh, Clover looking at the fact that the horror genre was the first genre that actually let women be the heroes or live to, to the end or at least face the bad guy or the villain a and the nuances of that and, and what what it represented, and she took um, case studies like Laurie from Halloween, very famous case study, or Ripley from Aliens, and she started seeing this sequencing of women being uh, the hero in the genre, which was far quite different from any other genre, your standard Western or your action or your romance or any other genre where you're used to the man saving the day, help saving the woman or... To, to some extent, being the hero. So, and then when she set that forth, you know, there were uh, a bunch of other theories in tandem with that, like Barbara Creed's Monstrous Feminine, talking about what exactly about the female uh, frightens, <laughs> whether it's a witch, whether it's the mother alien in Aliens, what about feminism it is is frightful to men or to uh, to anyone. So, and and there are other not a big breadth of books, but a healthy, a healthy starter. And my little books now in that that um, group, and hopefully my my next my final girl will be in that group as well. But um, not to get off subject. So final girl, these girls that are taking the lead in this genre, but the the thing I found interesting and in how I decided to take my path and angle my final girl was none of these girls were of any color. There were no black, no Asian, no Latino representation. These were all white girls. So, you know, even though we're looking at a period slasher where it's just predominantly white, that's where we, we were leaving exploitation and black exploitation behind and we're taking our horror to the suburbs for the most part with a few exceptions like Wolfen, but we're taking it to the suburbs. But all of these characters are white, which in turn all of the final girls or the new version of a hero, the heroine, they're all white. So uh, my whole journey was to find my, my final girl, the, the girls of color the non-white girls that are actually 
doing the same thing. And funny, as I started to put this uh, piece this together, uh, I noticed that for African American females specifically, there were two major periods of black horror. But before we get into that, let's let's do this. Let's define horror in the sense that it can be your standard monster or supernatural ghost, demon, um, or horrific event. I'm, I'm putting it like that so that we don't say, well, that's more a drama. Anything um, that is with, with that, with, that's outside of our um, scope of reasoning, or that's loosely, we could say, defined. Your demons, your monsters, your mummies, your vampires, your werewolves, your, your creepy kids, your possessions, your ghosts. We're going to group that all um, as horror, loosely, so that we, mo we can move forward and say, so if you want to find my final girl, what were the two periods that you mentioned two periods of black horror? And those two periods are, um, actually there's three, uh, so let me correct myself. There is the 1940s race films which had predominantly black cast, and this there wasn't a specific horror genre per se, but there were films with supernatural elements or monster-esque elements that could be considered horror. So I'm going to say you can find horror representations of black horror in the race films of the 1940s and early 50s. Um, and then the second being black exploitation because whereas most people when they hear black exploitation they automatically think Foxy Brown, Cleopatra Jones, Shaft, you know. There were also Blackula, which a lot of people know, uh Abbey, Sugar Hill, the nineteen seventy four, not the not the eighties version. Um Blackenstein, Doctor Black and Mr. Hyde, uh there, there are a few more. There are a few more. There's about, I want to say roughly about ten titles in the black exploitation, but that's that's a breath of something. So that's the second period of black horror representation in American horror. And then the last, which is a little bit more well known, I would say, would be uh, we'll call it gangster horror or that the the late nineties, late eighties, early nineties representation of horror that. Uh, was kind of technically kicked off by Death by Temptation uh, and even A Vampire in Brooklyn. But then there was Bones and a lot of things that came from, you know, Snoop Dogg and his group. And so, and and um, Tales, oh, I'm going blank and I can see it now, Tales from the Hood. So there, there was, that was that third uh, breath of black horror throughout American horror history. So we've got those in our heads. We have the 1940s, the, the, the speckling of supernatural or horror films in the race films. Then we have the 1970s black exploitation films with a subgenre of that subgenre being black exploitation horror films. And then the last being your 80s into 90s kind of gangster hood horror. We'll, we'll call it that for uh, lack of a better term. So yeah, those are your, your three main periods. And for this inaugural episode, um, I want to say that I started doing my thesis uh, production project by finding some of these women, meeting them, hearing their stories, and interviewing them. And I was lucky enough, and some of the people that worked in production with them or on black films of uh, these particular periods. So I was, I've was i been lucky enough to interview a handful of people over about a two and a half year period. So in tandem with me talking uh, each episode, I'm also going to pull up a little footage to give you a little bit about them and what they went through. So to that, I'm going to say uh, back a few years back, I was lucky enough to meet a really great woman who has a really great career, had a really great career in uh, cinema and television, 
and was kind enough to let me interview her, and her name is Marlene Clark. Ta-da! Magic. Uh, Marlene Clark is an actress of stage and screen, uh, born in New York City. She was married to Billy D. Williams. She has a career that spanned over th- almost three decades. Um, she's been in such films as Midnight Cowboy, The Landlord, uh, Beware the Blob, Slaughter, Enter the Dragon, The Beast Must Die, Switchblade Sisters, and most notably to many right now, Ganja and Hess. She was the lead. She played Ganja in Ganja and Hess. Um, and she's done a lot of television, everything from Bill Cosby or Richard Pryor show to uh, Marcus Welby, MD, Highway to Heaven, Head of the Class, you name it, Sanford and Son. She's done a lot. She's had a great career. And I was lucky enough to uh, get in touch with her through channels. And I went out to California. And uh, we had a talk. I interviewed her. And she was just, she is the loveliest, sweetest soul. It was a really great interview. And um, she has some really great insight on a lot of the AIP world, American International Pictures, and she did some things in Manila, and so we'll go ahead and cut to that. Here's a quick interview from Marlene Clark, actress's stage and screen. regards to the black exploitation genre, which everyone talks about, and more specifically with what I'm focusing on, horror films, what led you to the role, or who, or how did it come about? Which role? Um, let's start with Night of the Cobra Woman, because that's a standard horror, and then we'll move into the Gondor. Oh, that's okay. Here. Well, my agent called and said, go to Roger Corman's office, and, you know, there are pages there for you to look at, and so I looked at it and, you know, <laughs> I thought, oh, okay, who wrote this? <laughs> because he definitely has an antipathy for women, that's for sure. That was my first reaction. Anyway, they liked me, so they gave me the whole script to take home and, and think about it. And they told me that it was, was filming in, in Manila. And that was attractive to me because, you know, I'd never been to the Philippines and so that would be an interesting place to go. And, uh, I mean, the fact that, you know, every man that she becomes intimate, you know, dies <laughs> is not without, you know, reason for serious thought. I'm very sorry. May I help you? Do you have to go? I told you I have an appointment. What's the hurry? You've got plenty of time. I have to go. Goodbye, Ramon.
And so I met the writer and I knew exactly why it was the way it was. But anyway, we went off to the Philippines. I think we were there maybe eight or nine months. And um, we were certainly there through Christmas, which was sort of interesting. Um, and, you know, we shot in different locations around the Philippines. Uh, they don't have a union in the Philippines. so. You work, you know, around the clock. You, you work till five in the morning, go to your hotel and the car comes at eight to get you and you do it all over again. There's no 12 hour break, there's no turnaround time. There's none of that. It was not one of the better times that I ever had in my life. But one thing that it did do was, I was really sort of bitching about there's no turnaround time you know, we've shot for 16 hours and now, you know, we have two hours off and we want to go again. So, um, what uh, I was told was, you know, this is not the United States. Screen Actors Guild does not exist here. And um, you're sort of being very difficult. And I thought, you know what? That's not the reputation I want. So I'm going to roll with this because there will probably be other situations that will come up in other films where you don't want to be the one that's opening your mouth and bitching about it. You want to be the person that's rolling with it. So uh, that was a good lesson for me. Actually, it was a really good lesson for me. Did you ever feel like there was a difference that you were treated as an African-American woman versus the Caucasian actors on set? No. No? Most people thought I was Filipino. <laughs> Actually, I found out that I was hired because I looked Filipino. Really? I don't think I look Filipino. No. But when I was in the Philippines, people walk up to me speaking Tagalog. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah, so, so you're actually more north. Like, no, there was no, no, none of that. Did you ever experience that on any of your sets? No, I really didn't. I didn't. I and I, I, I made a movie with Jim Brown called Slaughter that shot in Mexico City for I don't know maybe six or seven weeks, and um, that sort of was sometimes difficult because Jim made it difficult. Question, when you did the first one, the Night of the Cobra Woman, do you think doing a horror kind of started to push you into the, the horror, like that horror genre? Were more scripts coming to you in that genre because they had seen that movie or kind of what was the after effect of that role? I don't think so because I don't know, I mean, I wasn't even aware that it was released in this country. I mean, yeah, this was the seventies. I I didn't know I didn't know that it was released here. Um, I didn't see it. There was a scene near the end where she's like jumped for wh whatever reason. I I don't know what the reason was by all these midgets who are, have all been painted black and it's supposed to be like a rape scene. For Cobra Yes. I don't know, I remember that. So, they didn't tell me that it was a rape scene, but they told them that it was a rape scene, but they didn't tell them that it was a pretend rape scene. So they thought it was a real rape scene. And I, I, I could not believe what was going on. I mean, I had like 10 midgets all over me trying to rape me because they didn't understand this was a movie. And I started throwing people, you know, are you out of your mind? It's, it, you know, rape, I wouldn't, shouldn't laugh at, but just the fact that they would even give that cue and the, wow. This is not wow. real life. This is pretend. Mm -hmm. But now we're done. I'm not doing this scene. You guys have not informed them.
that this is pretend because they're not actors. They don't. They, yeah, they they're they're apparently a little rapist, but that's not happening. Right. So they're not to come near me. They will not touch me. I am done. Was that like your last Corman? First and last, or did you ever? No, that wasn't my last Corman, but that was that was the end of that shoot that night. Because you don't do that. That you don't do. No, not at all. Not even. I think back in the day, they took more liberties than they could ever take now. I can't even imagine that happening without like getting super. They were all sued. painted black, and I mean, they just so many levels of wrong. Weird. And then they're just jumping all over you and trying to stick their fingers wherever they. I mean, it was like, oh, it was. I was like, are you kidding? And I just started throwing people. Did anyone else think this isn't right? And uh, you know, I said, D -d -d what are they doing? They're not, they think they're supposed to really rape me. Do you understand that? Do you see what's going on? Would you turn the camera off, please? You know, <laughs> I mean, because you're not going to film this. This is not going to happen. So how long did it take for it to click? Well, that when I walked off. They realized that was, that was, that not was not cool. going to happen. Not cool at all. But that was really scary. It was really scary. That wasn't your last day of shooting? Like no, I think there was other things that we had to pick up or something. But it wasn't the last. It was the last of the midgets, but it were wasn't you in, like, Were you wanting to leave at that point? Or were you under yes, contract? I was. But I wasn't going to have a reputation as people who, who star them off. Because they weren't going to say what happened. It would be my word against them that they had actually sent people over to really rape me in the scene. I knew that, so I just, you know, said, you know, you know, you know, you know the kind of reputation you don't want to have. Right. So it didn't happen. Just step away, calm down, and finish it, and get on a plane and get out of here. Right. So it was like that, but. I mean, there were other movies that I did, and nobody conducted themselves like that. So, yeah. You go to Manila and shoot a film back in the 70s. Locals, language barriers, a director that just wanted something wild. I mean, nowadays, I wouldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine. I think nowadays, there'd be like three or four watchdog nonprofits all over the scene, and all kinds of lawyers popping from, be like, beneath a bush. But back then, you just, you roll with it. But uh, yeah, what an experience. So uh, thank you for joining me for the world of Marlene Clark. This is KLM Brooklyn, and you're watching and or listening to My Final Girl Info and History, uh, the unearthed info and history of black girls in horror cinema. Peace out. <laughs>